Welcome to this week's episode of The Good Dram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show. Liked, commented, all that kind of stuff. Lots of comments. Um, and um, a big thank you to um, Milk and Honey who uh, retweeted my tweet. So I'm guessing that uh, um, they were more than happy with uh, with my review. Uh, and um, yeah, so excellent. Everything's, <laughs> everything's wonderful, isn't it? Um, or is it? Um, sort of, uh, t today's episode of the show is kind of like a bit of a, uh, sort of, one of those kind of questionable episodes of the show. I don't mean that in <laughs> with regards to the, 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 the content, but um, I don't know about you, but sort of, you know, at this time of year is sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of fast approaching uh, winter time, we're sort of moving through that lovely autumnal time of year. Um, one's thoughts tend to sort of move to, to peated malts. Um, well, no, actually, that's not strictly true. I like a peated malt practically well, all year round, you know. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the marketing monkeys kind of like, like to sort of, you know, um, portray this romanticised view of, uh, of, of whiskey drinking and this time of the year it's all burning log fires and heavily peated whiskey and all that kind of stuff, which is... <sighs> Yeah, most of us just turn the bloody heating up, don't we? Um, <laughs> yeah, we've all got central heat. We don't, we don't have the luxury of, uh, of uh, burning wood fires and all that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously some of you do, but most of us don't. But anyway, <laughs> this is just kind of like a, another example of, of how far the sort of the, the whiskey industry has actually moved away from reality, in, rea uh, in my personal opinion. Um, I mean, we're not just talking about the marketing monkeys, but talking about Pete... Um, the big hoo-ha uh, of, of, uh, of recent was basically Diageo coming out and saying that uh, their poor Ellen Maltings wouldn't be able to supply uh, non-Diageo distilleries uh, to the same kind of level next year and probably would have to stop in 2014. And, you know, predictably the, the mainstream media got hold of this and made a big, big fuss about the fact of, oh, buy your peated whiskey, you're not going to be able to buy it next year and all this kind of stuff, which is frankly bollocks really isn't it i mean we, i mean obviously if there's a sort of you know a, a slowdown in production of, of, of peated malts at certain distilleries obviously it's not going to have a knock-on effect until sort of like five or six years down the line and it kind of brings up a sort of quite a valid point i suppose in that um a it's bloody Diageo throwing its weight around. I mean, did they really need to say that? Could they have just had a quiet word with some of their customers, you know? But no, they had to basically, you know, because frankly, Diageo know jack shit about bloody the whiskey industry, really, don't they? I mean, yes, it's all about money at the end of the day. And, and it basically means that some distilleries are going to have to get creative with getting hold of their peated malt. Maybe some distilleries are going to have to move away from using peated malt or maybe not using peated malt all the time, you know? And it's not unheard of for distilleries to sort of, you know, tweak their style as and, as and when. So more often than not, it's due to demand rather than, than anything else. But um, it also brings up a kind of a wider question about malted barley per se. And the fact that, you know, um, there isn't so much malted barley knocking around because farmers are, well, essentially being screwed by the whiskey industry. You know, the whiskey industry wants their, their barley to be dirt cheap and farmers are going, well, I'm not making any money by growing this. I'll go off and, and grow something else like rapeseed or something like that where I can make a fair amount of money from, you know. Um, so what we're looking at is really a tightening up of sort of the supply of raw materials to the whiskey industry as a whole. Now, you can basically say, well, that's a bad thing, but equally you can flip it on the other side of the coin and say, well, actually, over the last sort of two decades, most distilleries have been really ramping up production. They're, they're working seven days a week. Um, they're hammering those poor old stills. They're, they're widening cut points. They, get, they want bigger yields. And frankly, I think a reset is 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 in in a, a good thing. It basically distilleries should sort of stop for a minute, basically go back to you know basics and say, right, well, we don't need to do a seven day week. We can do a five day week. We don't need to basically sort of widen our cut points to get the maximum amount of spirit. We can concentrate on the quality rather than the quantity. And um, I was at a, 
uh, you know, speaking to to sort of uh, you know other people within the, the whiskey industry not so long ago, and posed the question that you know really nowadays single malt whiskies should all be non-chill filled at bottle of forty six percent. Nobody agreed with me. Um, that the comments I got were, well, do you expect Johnny Walker to bottle a 46%? Well, no, I don't. I understand. I'm not stupid. I understand blends are all made to a price point, And if you want to keep your, your, your costs under control, the easiest way is obviously excise duty. So keep your ABV down. Now, I imagine there are probably some blends that if they could get away with bottling below 40%, probably bloody well would do. And the other comment that was made was, well, from another distillery was, well, our head distiller would love to do the whole range of, of their, the, the whiskies at non-chill filter and 46%, but they'd run out of stock. And I'm thinking, so, okay, so you're, you're essentially putting profit before quality here. You know, it's kind of like, you know, as a, as a blender, that, that your product would be considerably better quality if it was bottled without filtration and at 46%, yet you're quite happy to basically turn out something that's that's filtered and 40 percent you know I, that makes no sense to me and nobody agreed with me like i said it's a, and this is the thing you know that the, the, the whiskey industry can be at times frustratingly full of bollocks basically um and you know it's just you just sort of think well you know and it's not not the consumer that well that's put the single malts, you know, up on this bloody pedestal. It's the whiskey industry itself claiming that single malts are the pinnacle of all this kind of stuff. And yet, you know, they don't want to sort of um, chase the, the, the quality. They're quite happy to basically bottle it, sort of like, you know, w filtering the hell out of it and, and going, there you go, right, and so we're making shitloads of money, you know. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, everything's a business, distillery a business, they need to make money, but sometimes, you know, do profits come before quality, you know, and, well, anyway, that's, that's, that's me just on my soapbox for today, but anyway, so the point being is, um, I fancied doing an episode of the show on Pete, um, and, because I haven't done for one for a while on Pete, and I do enjoy a bit of Pete, as they say, um, so I had a dig, and I've come up with some, uh, hopefully, really interesting bottlings, so, um, I'd get off my soapbox and introduce today's lineup. Right, okay, so we're going to kick off with two bottlings from Elixir Distillers in their Port of Skag range. Um, over the years, I mean, Port of Skag has been around for donkeys, uh, and it's, I've never had an issue with the quality. Quality's always been very, very good. I mean, just, it's Kalila at the end of the day, you know, you have to go a long way to cock up Kalila. Um, and but I noticed age statements have been sort of diminishing. Um, so now we have an eight-year-old, I think, which is the sort of entry-level uh, Port of Skade bottling. It's bottled at 45.8%. Um, and retails somewhere between, well, depending on where you get it, between 35 and 45 pounds. So it's quite a <laughs> you know, broad range of prices for, for that whiskey out and about. Um, and the, the car strength bottling is obviously appears to have lost its uh, age statement as well and is now just called 100 proof and is bottled at 57.1%, uh, retailing for around about sort of 65, 65, 70 quid. Um, so yeah, that should be interesting. Now we're going to go and have a, a, a little dig through the archives. So uh, the third bottling we're looking at is um, uh, a privately bottled Lefroig. So uh, back in the day, I remember you know, Lefroig was quite ubiquitous amongst the independents. Nowadays, you don't see it for love nor money. Um, so this was uh, bottled in 2018. It's the uh, first edition Lefroig 16-year-old distilled in uh, April of 2002, uh, a single sherry butt uh, and uh, bottled at 59.5% and the code was HL15101. So should be interesting. Uh, the next bottling we'll be moving on to is again another old bottling. Uh, this was released in uh, sort of January of, uh, of 2017. Um, it is the Carnmore Celebration of the Cask Leche. Ooh, my favourite distillery. Um, <laughs> it's a 19-year-old distilled in October of 1997, bottled, like I said, in January of 2017. Uh, single Bourbon Hoggy 643024. So, um, old school Leche. Ain't had some of that for a while. Anyway. 
Next bottling we'll be moving on to is something you really don't see very often at all. This is an Ardbeg. Now, um, and, and it's an, a 27 year old Ardbeg, obviously but bottled by Boutique Whiskey Company. Uh, it's their batch 19, which was bottled in 2018, uh, bottled at 50.6%. If you wanted to purchase this now, I have seen it available online for the not inconsiderable price of €845, Euros. so what, somewhere in the region of what, about £730, pounds Frightening. Um, <laughs> that's hope it's going to be good. And the last bottling of today is something you really do not see anymore. Well, <laughs> Scott Selection. I haven't seen a bottling of Scott Selection in... What must be about 10 15 years, I guess. Um, this was one I dug out of a box and it, it's still alive, I can tell you that, which is amazing considering how little there was in, in the bottle. Um, it's a 1982 Kalila, um, it's 26 years old. I mean, who bottles old Kalila anymore? You just don't see it. I mean, again, you know, going back to when this was bottled in 2008, um, it was, yeah, you could get hold of it and they. The, the, the distiller oh, the bottlers would be happy to send you samples of it i mean <laughs> fat chance now this particular sample actually was uh entered into the independent bottling challenge of 2008 so like i said uh 1982 distilled uh Kalila, 26 years old 61.2 percent and aged in uh ex-american oak so i think that will be a very fitting finish for this afternoon's peat fest so let's kick off with a bit of Port of Skagen. Right, okay, so let's start off with the Port of Skagen, eight year old, 45.8%. They probably got away without chill filtering, I imagine. I mean, it's, I, I can't remember which, which distillery it was now, but there was um, a distillery that, that bottled at something like 43% and said this hadn't been chill filtered. And I was thinking, well, you can't get away with it. But, Apparently you can, so I would imagine this is just a shade under 46, so probably uh, non-chill filtered. Anyway, it's classic young Kalila, um, absolutely textbook. It's got that sort of fresh, pulped white fruit. Um, there's a, an almost kind of a garve kind of note happening. Um, nice, weighty, oily spirit underneath. It's it's modern Kalila. Um, not a lot of wood, as you would expect from the Kalila. Um, and a nice level of peat. Good, good, sort of moderately peated uh, uh, aromas, I would say. Yeah, nice and rich. Really good. Yeah, if you can pick this up for 35 quid, then, well, you, I wouldn't complain about that at all. Hmm, a little bit of burnt wood coming through now fattening up uh, the oils are coming out uh, as it spends some time in the glass um but yeah absolutely absolutely lovely whiskey let's see what the parts are Starts off with an actually quite a surprising amount of oak for Kalila, um, a sort of creamy vanilla, and then we get straight into the spirit character. We get that um, it's again, it's got a kind of agave kind of astringency. That sort of saltiness is kind of making it feel like a little bit agave like, and it's white fruit, um, kind of a bit of a nod to old school Kalila. Uh, but again, underneath all of that, there's some lovely weighty spirit. Um, it peters out a little bit on the finish. It's a touch on the short side, um, but you know what? Again, it's it's a lovely whiskey. It's got some um, got some lovely peat character. Again, not hugely peated, moderately peated, um, slightly earthy, slightly woody peat. Um, plenty of saltiness. The ABV is kind of like I said, giving it that kind of um, is emphasising the saltiness. And yeah, overall, I think that's actually a, a pretty damn good whiskey. Right, okay, so let's move on to the 100 proof. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? We're in more modern Kalila kind of territory now. It's a lot more heavier, weightier, denser, earthier. 
younger possibly um, but then it does feel like there's a, a little bit of maturity sort of uh, underneath all of that although the it's more about the fact that it's a more weightier feel to the spirit um, touch of bog myrtle seaweed less peat less intense peat it's it's a lot softer on the peat a lot subtler um, but again you know it's a pleasant nose 60 odd quid nose 60 70 quid nose mm. yeah it's kind of yeah I'm not so sure anyway let's see what class I Nice, nice palette. Lovely intensity. Sooty, earthy, more peat, bog myrtle, salt. Again, lovely, fat, oily character. Um, good length. A um, little bit of black pepper coming through on the finish. Little masked, but an actual fat. I mean, considering that's 57%, it, yeah, I'd quite happily drink that without uh, the necessity to add any water to it. I think that's absolutely fine. Love the intensity of it. Um, again, I, you know, 60 something odd quid. Mm, I would have to think twice about that one, it has to be said. But let's put a little drop of water with it. Not that it really actually needs it, but we'll just see what that does to the spirit. Mm. Um, it's got a little bit soapy now, um, certainly sweeter, less peat, the peat seems to have kind of pretty much disappeared completely. Um, it's really showing up its kind of youthfulness here, uh, and like I said it's got that slight soapy character, um, a lot less interesting. Let's see what the past right now. Again, it's a little bit soapy, it's a little bit, mm, a bit longer. There's some bitterness and, uh, creeping into the finish now with a bit of burnt wood. Again, the peat seems to have almost completely disappeared, which is um, a bit of a shame. Um, but it's longer. It's, it, you know, the, it, it's, it's pluses and minuses, I guess, when, when you put a little drop of water with this particular uh, whiskey. But, you know, on, on the whole, possibly a little bit overpriced. Um, but, you know, again, not too bad. Right, OK, so let's move on to the additions of Freud. So, um, refill sherry butt. Um, let's see what nose gives us. It's quite a nice nose. Um, fairly heavily sherry, sherry dominated. Um, treacle, peat smoke, dark dried fruit, rubber. Quite leafy. Um, touch of bog myrtle, some menthol. A little bit of medicinal peat coming through. Again, bit heavy on the sherry. Um, but, you know, it's not, not too bad. Whether, I think I've seen it listed at um, on um, Whiskey Base at uh, 240 odd euros. Do I think it's really worth 240 odd euros? Uh, no, probably not. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, it's fun, it's peat and it's sherry. Um, hmm. Getting a bit leathery now. Let's see what that's like. Tar, tar, peat, sherry. Pretty straightforward, it has to be said. Um, good depth, good length. Um, I've had more complex Laphroaigs in my time, it has to be said, but it's certainly not, not an unpleasant um, Laphroaig. Lovely aftertaste, tobacco smoke, uh, peat smoke, dried fruit. Yeah, it's... it's like I said, probably not the most complex of the frogs I've ever ever come across, but yeah, not too bad. 
Right, okay, so let's move on to a bit of leche then, shall we? Oh yes, that's old school leche. Um, do you know, <laughs> Frank, bizarrely, I kind of almost miss the, the old sulfury, um, slightly cardboardy um, leche. Um, Consider it as a, as we well know they've cleaned it up quite considerably. Um, it's again one of those sort of odd, quirky noses. You have this kind of slightly sulphurous, meaty kind of spirit, but there's a, a little bit of sweet sugar coated barley, um, some stringent peach smoke, um, a little bit of sulphur. It sort of works actually. I mean, it's not the it's not the worst old leche nose I've ever come across, it has to be said. And, um, yeah, the, the sort of sulfurousness is kind of like almost mingling in with the, the, the sort of smoked meat and the peat. Yeah, I, I, I guess if you, if, you know, it's just kind of, um, yeah, it is, like I said, old school leche, but kind of not quite as old school as some old school leches could be, if you see what I mean. Anyway, so it'll pass on. Bit short, but it's not too sulfury, actual fact. I mean it's got that slight meatiness, it's a bit simple. Um there's a little bit of honey, there's some barley, there's some smoked bacon, um, peat smoke, um, astringent coastal notes. Um, there's a little bit of a dirtiness there in, on the mid palate, but again, it's not something you would kind of like really get particularly upset about. So, um, there's a bit of a bitterness on the finish as well. Um, it, it, like I said, it's old school leche, but it's it's kind of old school leche light, if you if you like. I mean, it's not the full on sort of experience. It's kind of yeah, you know, a little bit sort of cleaner than that. Um, let's put a little drop of water with it and uh, see what that does to it. Doesn't really didn't really need it, um, and it hasn't really done it. A huge amount of favours. It's got a bit kind of overly oily and overly cardboardy now. Um, so maybe we are sort of like you know classic old uh, leche. Let's see what the part's like. Yeah, I think we're going to move on. That really didn't take water particularly well, shall we say? Um, but neat, it wasn't wasn't too bad at all. Right, okay, so let's move on to the 27-year-old Ardbeg. Like I said, if you want a bottle of this, you really are going to have to uh, remortgage your house. Um, oh, is that stunning or is that stunning? Um, that's wonderfully mature Ardbeg, woody and briny and mature uh, I've got that lovely mature peat character it's not sort of in your face peat it's quite mellow dusty a little bit of palmer violet a little bit of sweet barley oh the balance on that is absolutely stunning um, a little bit of smoked meat some oxidized apricot touch of sawdust um, I mean, that's gorgeously complex. I mean, obviously it wasn't 800 odd euros when it was first released, but I mean, I imagine it was, uh, when was that released? Uh, 2019 or, or so. So I would, oh, I hate to think how much it was, but probably about four or 500 quid, I imagine. I don't know. For a 50 CL, I hasten to add. Um, but oh, you just don't get whiskies like this anymore. Um, not unless you have sort of, you know, vast amounts of disposable income. Um, the likes of us will never get this. Um, oh, it's just, I could keep sniffing this all day. It is stunning, absolutely stunning. Let's see what the on. Mm. 
Mm, beautifully complex, mellow, sawdusty oak, sort of lovely sort of mature apricot, sweet peat, a lovely combination of sweet and, and, and earthy peat, a little bit of bitterness from the oak right on the finish, oxidised fruit, lovely saltiness as well, I mean it's still got that I mean, I, my, my tongue feels like it's been coated in, in, in salt. Um, really intense, uh, absolutely beautifully balanced. Um, it kind of kicks off with that sort of maturity, but then because the sort of like the saltiness is really coming through strongly on the mid palate on the finish, it really doesn't feel that old. I mean, maybe this particular cast could have carried on going for quite a few more years um, and would have been uh, even more expensive. Um, beautifully vibrant, um, slightly woody still. It's it, it kind of, it's kind of more sort of, mm, kind of moving towards a sort of a colliery kind of characteristic. I mean, yes, there was the obvious kind of burnt woody kind of um, ard beggy kind of notes, but it's not as intense as you would expect. And like I said, it is moving towards a more kind of older, old school Kalila, which hopefully <laughs> we'll get to in just a second. Um, but either way, I mean, that is just frighteningly good. <laughs> Right, okay, so moving on to the final whiskey of the afternoon. This is a 26-year-old Kalila. Let's see what the nose gives on this. Oh, my God, that's good. Um, oh, that's complex. I mean, that's dense, oxidised apricot, uh, dried fruit, stringent coastal notes. It's still got that lovely saltiness. Um, juicy orange fruit, rich oily mm. touch of rubber a little bit of coffee um, again it's got that beautiful weight to it um, and probably a bit more denser than the hard bag and, and to be honest with you it's, it gives it a run for its money I mean and Scott selection you you know they used to be what they used to be distributed by Speyside uh, distillery um, but I've not heard from them in, in years. I assume they, they, they've kind of uh, ceased, ceased bottling, but they used to bottle some bloody good whiskey, it has to be said. A um, mm, little bit of coffee, touch of toffee as well. Old cinder toffee. Um, oh my God, this is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I, I remember I used to stock it. Well, when I, you know what I mean. Um, and I used to stop quite a fair amount of, um, of Scott selection, it has to be said, but I don't know what this would retail for now, um, or if you could ever get your hands on it. I mean, I'd love to have kept hold of a bottle of it, but unfortunately, you can't keep them all. Oh, let's see what that's on. Juicy, rich, oily, dried apricot fish, um, gentle waft of peat. It's kind of just sort of, just so delicate and elegant and there's a little bit of bitterness. Um, the fruit is full and juicy and rich and almost honeyed. There's a lovely saltiness. Um, I mean, that is just absolutely sublime. Um, and, you know, will we see the likes of this again? Well, not unless you've got very, very deep pockets. I mean, that is just absolutely stunning. A 61% and it really does not taste it. Yes, all right, you can feel the alcohol and it is emphasizing the saltiness. Um, but really, it's dangerous. You, could, that, you don't need to put water with this. Um, I'm going to put a drop of water just to see what happens to it. Yeah, it's kind of, I think, um, I think it's kind of showing its age and um, it's certainly not quite as evocative now, put a little drop of water with it and I think it's probably, probably more to do with the age of the sample than um, anything else. Anyway, let's see what happens.
really sweet now. Again, I don't. I think I wouldn't say water hasn't done it any favours because it's, it's sweetened it, it's it's lengthened it. Um, but I think because the sample is quite old, it's kind of not sort of. Uh, I, I guess it's not kind of indicative of what it was or what how it would be if you had a bottle and you just cracked it open now. Um, neat though, absolutely sublime, stunning old Kalila. Um, will we see kind of whiskies like that again? I have absolutely no idea. I probably won't, but anyway, um, that was one hell of a finish. So yeah, good stuff. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Okay, firstly, a big thank you to uh, uh, Elixir Distillers for the Port of Skag samples, obviously to Hunter Lang for the sample of um, the um, uh, Edition Spirits bottling. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's pretty damn good, the, the eight-year-old. I mean, like I said, if you can get that for 35 quid, then you're laughing because it is, you know, classic um, youngish Kalila, you know, what more can you say? Um, less enamoured by the hundred proof. Um, I think neat. It was it was perfectly fine. Really didn't take to water at all. Well, uh, which was actually quite a surprise. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have expected that of uh, of Kalila, but there you go. These these things have a tendency to happen. The addition spirits Lafroy, they have bottled better. Lefroids or more interesting Lefroids, I should say. Um, I mean, not to say that that wasn't a good whiskey. It was. It was a bit simple. It was a bit kind of like peat and sherry. Um, but you know, if that's kind of your bag, then then fine. Um, I quite like the Leche actually. It was kind of old school enough to be interesting, rather than sort of old school enough to be a bit grim. Um, it was. You know, yeah, not not too bad at all. I can't remember whether I stopped that back in the day. Probably did, I would imagine, because of that kind of fact. And and you know, it's always um, it's always nice when you come across these sort of whiskies that uh, or from distilleries that you probably don't think particularly highly of, and then um, you suddenly go, yeah, actually that's not too too shabby at all. Um, so yeah, yeah, in interesting. Um, the boutique yard bag, oh, stunning, absolutely stunning. It has to be said. Maybe not quite so woody as some old yard bags that I've come across, but you know, the, the no arguments about the quality, the depth, um, arguments about the, the the cost of it. I, I imagine, but you know, the the quality of the spirit was was absolutely stunning. And the Scott Selection Kalila, I mean, again, stunning old Kalila. Um, Yes, all right, the fact that I think that putting a little drop of water with it was um, probably not such a great idea, considering it was it didn't do it any favours. And I think, like I said, it was probably more to do with the age of the sample than the actual um, spirit itself. But um, neat, absolutely stunning. I mean, I, you know, that was a real throwback whiskey for me. It reminded me of some of the old... Uh, old islas that uh, I used to come across about 10-15 years ago um, and obviously unfortunately don't these days but there you go that that's life as they say so anyway hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show um, a bit different I suppose um, so all that's left to say is good afternoon and good drowning.